Welcome Spartans to the latest podcast of all book club. I'm your host today, David, and with me is the full crew. Woo! It's gonna be exciting. Yay, that's me. We have Aaron. Hello. Oren. What's up guys? And Krista. Hello. And that's everybody. And we're all together for a lovely book club, which is weird considering that this book wasn't written for any of us. We're all aging out of this book, even Krista. Yep. Krista's too old for this book. I'm too old. I'm pretty sure all Halo fans are too old for this book. I think the purpose of this book, which we'll probably talk about, is to make new Halo fans. Yay. To suck them into the Halo universe because we need more Halo peoples. To make new Halo fans, the existing Halo fans just need to breed. That's how that works. <laughs> it's not quick enough. They need those fans right now. They need those hits. <laughs> Nine months is too long to wait for more Halo fans. Exactly. I mean, Aaron, you're doing good with those niece and nephews that you're training up. I don't think any of us have got anyone near close ready. Ian has some kids. True. Ian does have some kids. It's all just Colin. They're Spartan induction age, both of them. That's that's the ideal age. That's true. But even they, are they too old for this book? I don't know. I don't know. That is the question. The guy, guys, this Halo book club is Halo Battleborn. That's right. We are up to date. We are ready. We are on fire. We got the new hotness. We got a new book club for the new hotness of the book. The fire hurts. Yeah, it does. Uh, the author is Cassandra Rose Clark. So it's a brand new author into the Halo Hall of Fame authors. The publisher is Scholastic, which is super new. All new publisher, new author, new everything. The format is print and audiobook. I don't think it's an ebook, but I didn't look. It didn't is. Look. Is there ebook formats? There is an ebook, okay. Yeah, I bought it. I could only find it in the Kindle store in French. Uh, okay. Yeah, well, it's on the. Uh, it, so. Yeah, I got it in the. The American iTunes. Okay, so it's there for each, for all formats. The release date was the 1st of January. Was it really? 1st of January 2019? I think yeah. so. That's what it said in Hillopedia. Oh man, crazy. Okay. Its length is 304 pages, so it is not huge, but it is... It is part of a series though, so something to keep in mind. Exactly. Exactly. Because I was saying, talking to Chris and Colin earlier, like I only noticed till when I read the back of the book today, after I finished it, it actually says... The new young adult series, so we can fully expect sequels. I think one of them's been announced. Yeah. Has it? And it's coming out in October. It's called Merid- Meridian Divided. Oh, And okay, I'll tell yeah. you how I know this. It's because Interesting. when I downloaded the audiobook, the title for the file or whatever is Halo Battleborn Young Adult Novel Series Number 1 is like the full okay. like this, like title. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it has me wanting to pre-order... The uh, the second one, which is Meridian Divide, which comes oh, out nice. October first. I think that's probably a scoop, a news scoop for the peoples. I want to say something about the cover. The cover's very shiny. It is super shiny. You can leave fingerprints all over the shiny part, and it bugs me. <laughs> it is a shiny ass sparkly cover that says, "Look at me and read me, young child." Read <laughs> young me. young child, I am shiny. You want me? Come get me. It's very. It is. Very, it's a very shiny book. I'm going to give a quick summary and then we'll get into what actually happens in this story. So the characters are, we have Saskia, Dorian, Evie, Victor. Aren't exactly friends from their small high school in the middle of nowhere colony on the world of Meridian, a world we know from Halo 5. Each has their own problems from absent parents to supporting their family, getting into a good college and making the next hollow film. But those problems were nothing next to the threat facing their world. An alien alliance known as the Covenant is laying siege to Meridian for reasons that aren't so easily explained. With with their village in flames, four teens themselves stuck above ground, locked out of the town shelter where the rest of the survivors are gathered. Together, Saskia, Dorian, Evie and Victor are thrust into battle with nothing but a few scavenged weapons and an injured Spartan, one of the UNSC's super soldiers. What's forged from the destruction will determine the fate of Meridian and tilt the battle for humanity's survival. Now, this book doesn't feel like that, but that's what they're giving you. (laughs) I mean, that's pretty much like uh, 80% of the book right there. It is. It pretty much tells you where the story goes. Um, And the timeline is unusual in this book, which I was talking with the guys before. There's no date stamped across this book, which is unusual for a Halo book, because the setting is so important and the timeline is so important to Halo canon because of the major events that happened. And... If you're like us and you've played the Halo games, you know from Halo 5 that Meridian is glassed and is a dead-ass planet. And when we're getting to this book, we see that it's not. It's a colony, it's a thriving world, the Covenant are battling the humanity, so it is pre-Halo 2, I would imagine, based on, it's actually pre-The Great Schism, uh, where the Covenant, because you're seeing elites here, and there's no brutes, 
There is, I suppose, the fact that it isn't a glassed world. There's a different AI involved here. I don't think they ever talk about the governor, do they? Is there any mention of the governor no. Sloan or anything? No. None of that. He comes with the company later. Yeah, that's probably you're probably true actually. Yeah, when they come to mine out the glass, our timeline, as stated here, is twenty five forty eight to twenty five fifty one, which is in around the t- after CE, but before Hitler. That too. is the the entire time span of the Battle of Meridian. So this is the start of it. So it's sometime in twenty five forty eight, but we do not know when. Where did the Battle of Meridian come from? The Battle of Meridian in the lore, it comes from, I think it's the data drops in the Halo 5, you know, Meridian, like, hub level. Okay, actually, when you walk around that world? Yeah, the info comes from information there. There's a little details on the Battle of Meridian and how the the Covenant, like, held siege to the planet for a few years. That seems nuts. Yeah. Normally, the Covenant just come in and wipe out humanity's struggles, but... They wanted something on it, though. That's what I mean. It must have been a small force focused on a certain area, because this book makes it sound like humanity are winning and beating back the Covenant, that they can't reinforce their ground troops. It sounds very similar to the way uh, Reach, the game, starts before the major fleet comes in. It sounds like you have a... You have a jammer, you have a dome, except it's a shield dome, and you have a couple of ships. Yeah. The same thing there, they were able to hold them off until the reinforcements arrived. So it sounds like something similar to that. Yeah. Like we said, we're in the Hiesta system. The Hiesta 5 is a gas giant, that's the main planet, and Meridian is in fact a moon that goes around that planet. So there's some background for you on where this happens. It, there is the village that's referred to in the uh, in the start of the book is Bursar Meh. Uh, Brimsur Mer, they pronounce it in the audiobook. Brimsur Mer. Okay, that's the village. It's mentioned numerous times throughout the book. So just, you know, the, this is one of the smallest scope Halo books ever written, I would say, because oh, yeah. it literally takes place in or around this village. There's no hopping around. The four characters are more or less together for the bulk of this book. Every chapter is from a different character's perspective, and it kind of hops that way the whole way through the story. So other than i don't think we ever get a story from from own's perspective a chapter from own no we don't am i right the spartan we don't it's always one of the one of the four teenagers we'll kind of get into it because other than that there's only one other character to mention own like i said is a spartan who comes into the story around the, the book around the middle part middle point and we have salome who is a or how is Sol- salome uh, salome the audiobooks uh pronounced it Sol- call her dumb okay, dumb Sol- so is a dumb AI who is uh, an amalgamation of a billion people playing around with her. The kind of mess messing with this AI is very much heavily corrupted by like people messing in her code, which seems super simple to do in this book. This dumb AI just pretty much looks after this town. I imagine a, probably a larger area than this one village. Because uh, I get the very sense that the population of this village is not very high. Yeah, I kind of got the sense of like a superintendent kind of equivalent to New Mombasa. Yes. Just not yeah, pretty much. as functional. Yeah, New Mombasa was like a big city. Well, the thing about that's interesting about her is it's probably the town probably can't replace her. It's probably really expensive to just get a dumb AI. So instead, they just keep like patching shit into her yeah yeah so it's kind of made her broken they would never need to replace her because she is a dumb AI. you can just update her she's not uh like she has an unlimited life expectancy because she's dumb as long as you don't like break the code true but it makes it sound like the code is broken do you know what i mean she has a quirkiness to her because of people messing around with her but we'll get to that in the bulk of the story according to halopedia the population i don't know if this is post this might be post attack. It says here the population of Meridian is five thousand three hundred, but I don't know. Oh, that has, it has to, to be post. They had a huge. They had big cities that they were talking about in this. Well, they had a couple of cities. I thought the. I thought at one point in the book they said like maybe eighty thousand. Yeah. Okay. That sounds. That sounds better. Yeah. I'd say there was about five thousand at Meridian at the time of the Halo Five. I would imagine the moon's not very big either. So. That's true. That's true. Let's kind of get into the bulk of the story. So it kicks off with these kids and each has their own chapter and it's pretty much i did like the introduction to the different kids as we kind of move through i did roll my eyes a little bit at the obvious youtuber in the making that is yeah, the character in this yeah. book of like uh he's like talking about his channel and get everyone watching oh this guy likes my channel so he likes me because he's like he's like a follower and i'm like oh my god but they don't dwell on that very much the one that Biggest positive of this book is that is there anything you don't like about it, the book moves so fast that you get away from it pretty quick. Yeah. It's like, oh, yeah, he's a YouTuber. He makes a point of making a movie and they're making a little hollow movie with his friend Evie. 
Um, I'm talking about Victor is this character and he is I don't know yeah he's just essentially a YouTuber and he's making videos and making wants to make movies and stuff you have Evie who is like his overprotective father but she is herself a math genius and is very good with AI which will come in useful you have Dorian who is a musician and I have to say the the scene where he describes his music and his when he's playing um on the sea is so actually sounds awesome like the projections and stuff yeah like he takes the sound of a starship lifting off and turns that into like a light show and makes it into a song and it makes it sound like he's some kind of digital dj that's tied in with like this live band playing so he's making an audio visual thing on the fly it sounded like he had one of those like soundboards where you can kind of the different buttons on the soundboard make different noises and then he strings them together so he's technically playing an instrument but he's basically playing a computer yeah and it sounded cool it sounded cool as fuck that's dorian and then there is saskia who is he's kind of introduced as like this outsider girl from the town she goes to school with everyone else but doesn't have any friends she's she's like they make it sound like a blow in like somebody coming in from their holiday home and just staying in a place so they're not native but they are they have a term for them in this book i'm blanking what it's called but i'm sure anyone who lives in Small towns where there are holiday homes and people come. You have a term for them. You know what I'm trying well, to say. Well, and also she's crazy rich, so... She is crazy rich because, as it turns out, it's a huge plot point. Um, her parents are weapon manufacturers. I can't remember the name of the company, but it's a big one, I want to say. And they're illegally manufacturing weapons for not just the UNSC. And that's a big kind of plot point that comes into play later on. So she's kind of an outsider because she's aware of what her parents are doing. Yeah, she just highly speculates that's what they're doing. Yeah, yeah, she's she's not dumb, but um, she she's just not really, she's a kid, do you know what I mean? She doesn't care that much. I don't think she gets it that involved, but anyway. So these are the four characters. They all meet up more or less through this music scene and go and see this, this gig. And the first concert is like on underground and it's on in like a kind of um, the shelter, shelter that comes in the, it's like a major, yeah, major plot point. And then the Covenant attack. All the characters are in different places doing different things. So Evie and Victor are like filming down the coast. Saskia, I think, is just at home. Yeah. In her house. Well, I think like her security system just activates once Covenant is are in the area. So she's like, ah, shit. Which is crazy. So then you go to Dorian, who's playing a gig on the boat. Like I said, it's cool. And then the Covenant ship pretty much comes in. And they don't really describe what attacks them, but I think it's buggers. Buggers yeah, come it's down onto the ship. They were yeah, flying. he says they're drones. Flying. Oh, they were drawn. Yeah, well, he said, yeah, he says that later when he's fighting with Owen that they're fighting drones, the same people or the same aliens that were attacking us on the boat. So he pretty much beats one of them with like his guitar and like runs and dives and stuff like that. And pretty much the buggers are just killing all these kids at this gig. So there's like loads, there's a scramble of people burning, and it's pretty crazy as you can imagine. They definitely downplay the death a little bit. They did. They definitely glossed over it. All of the death throughout the book is very downplayed. <laughs> It's off-screen death, even though if you were to visually see this scene played out, you'd imagine those buggers are murdering people all over that boat, considering the fact that none of them actually survive other than Dorian. They kind of get away with it being like, oh, he was just very confused and dazed and didn't really see what was going on. Yeah, very much so. They're also telling the story like from his point of view, and I think that's one thing that this book does well when it jumps from point of view to point of view. And so it's really whatever he sees is what's described. So because he... They say that he's dis- confused, disoriented. We only see his window, so they don't go. The author doesn't go into great lengths to describe the huge battle that took place because Dorian's not experiencing the huge battle. He's worried about getting his friends off the boat, which he does. So fair play to Dorian. He steps up. Is very much then it cuts to Evie and Victor have a crazy scene where they're in a car, they're driving, they run over a jackal. The jackal. Well, don't really run over. I think the jackal just does a flip and lands on the roof of the car. Yeah, I think it jumps on them. It jumps on them. It crashes in. It, it, they crash into a tree. The jackal punches through the windshield and grabs at Evie. Victor freezes. Doesn't really know what to do. They scramble in the car. There's a big kind of like hustle bustle. Evie gets out and runs, but her ankle is wounded from the jackal. And then jackal is standing over her, I think, about to either eat her or kill her or do something. It doesn't have a weapon at this point. And then it is pretty much shot in the back of the head and is down and then Saskia comes through with a rifle and she's just killed this jackal and totally saved Evie's life and then Victor comes out of the car totally like besmitten because he's a crush on Saskia and doesn't realize what the fuck's going on so then these characters go back to her house 
And they're all freaking out, by the way, because they don't know where to do or what's going on. And everyone's always afraid of the Covenant, the Boogeyman, the Covenant. They learn bits in school and they're kind of trying to remember what the name of the things are because obviously these are kids that live in this small village on this moon who probably never thought the Covenant would ever come. And now they're here. They know that they have Town's plan is to like go into this shelter and stay there until the UNSC come to the rescue. Is pretty much how everything so they know they have to get to town get to the shelter that's where their families are going to go but they're so far out of town they know it's too late that's i think the sasuke pretty much convinced them to come back to her house yeah well she says she and has like security regroup. in her house and... i'm pretty sure the scene just cuts between these three characters making back to the house and then it's like it sounds kind of like a super modern slick house in the middle of the woods that has a crazy defense grid around it big walls you can't even see the doors weapons and all sorts of like stationary turrets around it and sounds nuts sasuke can kind of get herself in and out and she brings these guys inside and produces medigel which is pretty cool and then she the description i liked how to describe how medigel worked and stuff like that and how it just fixes everything so it was a nice convenient thing to have in this book to help fix up fix up these characters and it comes into play a little bit later on as well what else happens here now i think they talked sasuke brings them down and shows them she has like a crazy ass comm center built in so they're trying to access like get a message out and they can't because obviously the covenant are jamming everything um there is a warning message i think the ai is playing it through this comm telling everyone go to the center go to their shelter sorry so the guys are panicking about what do we do i think they convinced do they stay the night and then they go next morning yeah they, well they stay the night and then but they wait for um dorian to... he wakes up on the beach and pretty much he dived into water uh, after his gig and woke up on the beach he's the only kind of survivor so i think he moved, he sees the crashed car i want to say and then he kind of like makes his way somehow to the house yeah i think he just he like i think he either follows a trail or just sees the house and then because I, I remember him commenting on like he was like pounding on the door or like throwing a rock at it and he was like i probably shouldn't be doing this because there's a bunch of turrets and like heavy duty guns also they talk about the turrets a lot and never use them they never come into play yeah a lot a lot happens around this house and they're never found out or never discovered also they were like at some point in the game they're testing weapons and practicing shooting and no one finds them and it's it's just kind of strange how this house is like always a safe zone i imagine it just it's so far out that it's just not I mean, the ground forces on the Covenant seem very focused in terms of the town, and they don't seem to care about they, they don't seem to care at all about the humans that aren't inv- that are kind of on the outskirts. I think it's because her parents are supplying weapons to the insurrectionists. I think the house is literally in like the back end of nowhere, because at one point Saskia talks about how her mum was demonstrating grenade launchers for insurrectionists and like. A grenade launcher is not a quiet they, weapon. They say it in, in no uncertain terms that that's what her parents are doing. You need a shady house to do your shady deals. Yes, you do. But uh, I forgot to mention, each of the characters have a thing that makes them useful, as you can imagine. So you have Evie, who is this smart tech person who does various hackings of computers throughout the stories uh, of this the story in this book. You have Saskia, who pretty much is the weapons dealer and supplier. She has a house. She has this amazingly kitted out base of operations and awesome weapons for the guys to use you have victor who's the one guy who can shoot because his sisters are in the unsc and they taught him how to shoot so he's the shooter Evie's guy mom is also in the unsc that's true it's a good point evie's mom is away all of i think all of them had family members in the unsc dorian's parents i think are in the unsc yeah. but they left him there with his uncle and i get very insurrectionist vibes and we can talk about that later because uh, very important thing is happens and never gets talked about ever again uh, in the book i imagine that will come into play later on there is also who else dorian is the pilot that's an important thing to note he flies little dinghies around helping repair things so he's very good as a like kind of engineer and technician and stuff like that and he can fly and that's the four characters and their amazing abilities that all get used throughout the story of this book so you can see very much where this book is going in building a team together of these people and that there's a big focus on team 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 later on so then you, sorry you got the four characters how hiding out in Sasuke's house they're scared they don't know what to do Sasuke's parents are gone off planet she very much makes it sound like they knew the covenant were coming so they ran away and just left her there they don't seem to care about her at all is it that they knew the covenant were coming or is it that they were like about to be arrested I don't know They ma- she made it sound like it was the covenant that they knew that something was happening so they left they never really mentioned about them getting arrested I think they knew the covenant were headed there which means the UNSC would be headed there which means if they discover the house then her parents would be arrested I think that's the train of thought that they were having because if the covenant comes 
I mean, whoop de doo they're not going to arrest them. They're just going to murder them. But if the UNSC comes... They ran out their way. Yeah. All the rest of them have family members who go underground into the shelter. So now their plan is to get into the shelter to their families. What they're going to do is these characters then wake up the next morning. They have found some weapons. Was there like a scuffle with like a grunt in the woods? Did that happen? No, I think that was, I think that was on the way. That's on the way here. So they have... Sasuke has a rifle of some description yeah and they make their way through the woods going towards town in the process of getting to town they notice rustling in the forest so they all dive in cover there's what we now know to be grunts running around and then something we don't know who kills all these grunts and runs away and that later turns out to be a spartan but we didn't know that at the time the guys just hide in the woods a bunch of fighting happens there's a bunch of dead grunts so they steal the weapons they get a needler and they get a plasma pistol they kind of test them out in the woods to figure out how to use them i kind of like that there's how they describe using their weapons and stuff like that and what it was like to pick up a needler and stuff like that i thought it was pretty cool also the description of how you use a plasma pistol was cool where you just you you don't have a trigger you squeeze the grip and then you let go of it yeah to kind of like pulse and shoot and i'm like that sounds really awkward to use but Anyway, you can see why someone would hold the bottom of it. As you see them, when you see people using the guns, that the Marines actually hold the plasma pistol underneath. That's because they're squeezing and letting go with their other hand. That's well, they cool. kind of they kind of cup it, do the yeah, cupping yeah. method. And where else are we going? Right, so they make their way in, into town. Do they split up? No, I think they're all they're all at the computer station, the comm station. To- That's right. Sorry, they come across Dorian knows because he fixes things all around town that there's a hidden old uh, comm station. We kind of skipped them. Dorian at some stage knew about this because his uncle and him came out to repair it. They repaired it because the town has been undergoing kind of power failures. That's because the Covenant have been fighting up in space and no one on this village knows at all that this ha- this is happening. I, I thought that was a pretty pretty funny little element. <laughs> yeah, they're losing power and various things are breaking down because things are getting shot somehow. So there's like this plasma burns in like various places and like one of their power co- comm stations gets hit and they go out and try and fix it and they're trying to understand what's going on. It's like it's like the Covenant advance team that are in, I think. Maybe there's a scouting team. Like something similar to Reach where they go in and cut off the comms tower first at the start of the game. That's kind of, that's what I got from it. I thought the Covenant were going to comm station to shut them down so they could gain access to the town easier i didn't cop that but that makes way more sense to think about it so anyway come back to comm station these guys hack in they get in touch with the ai she tells them pretty much what's going on everyone's down in the um most of the town's population made it down into the shelter they're pretty much stuck there she won't open the shelter doors because the covenant are there so there's a threat assessment based on blah 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 blah. she says nope too much covenant in the area you have you guys have to get out of town you can't come in they say screw you ai lady and they turn her off (laughs) Yeah, basically. Then they decide they're going to go into town again anyway. So I think there's, a, in some way, they split up because, I'm trying to say, two. it's only two of the guys that, f- that come across the hunter yeah. as soon as they come to town. I'm not sure what the split was there if someone went back or Sasuke wanted to go back to her house and didn't want to go on and the guys aren't really gelling well as a team at the moment. Did they turn on S- uh, Salame again? So I think like two people stayed by, maybe Evie was trying to program something and... I think that's what it was, yeah. That's how they figured out, oh, she's like all jumbled. That's right, Evie was trying to hack the AI to try and see to make her open the doors and then um, realize she couldn't, from here, she couldn't figure out how to do that. And then the other two went into the city, find out more stuff. And go a bit of scouting. Sorry, that was that Saskia and on. Victor and... Then Dorian stayed. Yes, I think you're right. Dor- Dorian stayed with Evie. Yeah, because Victor then, the two of them, like, come across a hunter. And it's kind of a cool situation of just, like, these kids, like, one guy just empties, the, he empties his needler at it and just runs. Just pan- totally panics and runs. Sasuke is trying to shoot at him. Obviously not doing very well. And the two of them just have to run. And it's a great scene of just the hunter shooting the crap out of everything they're hiding behind. Barging through buildings, just kind of crashing them kind of trying to chase them down these kids run back into the woods and hide only to be saved at the last minute by a spartan that runs in and just kicks this hunter's ass <laughs> toe to toe uh, i get the impression it's very much a uh, melee fight and then we're kind of introduced to the character of own who is a spartan three who is by himself because he got separated during the drop yeah during his drop and was injured i think was he injured in his drop i want to no say he, he was, was injured by the hunter okay so he's fighting the hunter and he gets injured then he, um, the guys bring him back to the team. They all meet up together and have a great chat in Zaski's cool, awesome base of operations. Also, Owen's a beta Spartan 3. Is he wearing Mjolnir armor? What kind of armor is he wearing? He's got Mjolnir. Okay. 
because he makes a talk uh, when he gets to, to the house when she talks about taking the armor off he, he said he can't use the mounting system yeah he if he takes it off he'll never get it back on again also fun fact to mention um owen has recently been added into more halo lore oh he has been added into there's lore for outpost discovery and in the universe, he is one of two Spartans that attend Outpost Discovery on Earth to raise oh. awareness oh, of the cool. UNSC. Interesting. Oh, I like that. So he is the avatar item that you get for attending Discovery is a Spartan Owen avatar costume. Oh, cool. Oh, that's cool. Interesting. So just to say that while we're here. Well, it's nice to see them using the Spartan 3s. So does SBI armor not require a mounting station? No. No, it's like ODST armor. Yeah, it's like souped up. Oh, uh, okay. It's just got active camo in it. Because he's a beta Spartan, he's not the same as the Gammas, so he doesn't have all the crazy drugs in him. He, um, he's a way more down to earth, and you think he's a very normal character in this, and I think he's 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 very good. I, I like him. Um, I think his character development is quite well. They're very fast, so I know we're talking about his book, but like a lot of this stuff happens very quick in the book. So this team of kids go from team of kids to friends to being Spartan trained, to being like pretty crazy ass team at the end of this book of like how none of these kids died is crazy is beyond me. But anyways. <laughs> well, because they're being shot at all the time and I guess they're Constantly. fighting stormtroopers because they just cannot aim. I mean, they did hold back on the elites till the end of the book, which is probably the only reason why. Also, what is noticed when the guys are kind of before, I think before they meet the hunter, they see a locust or is that later on? I think that's I later. Think that's later. That's, they're in their reconnaissance. Reconnaissance. That was cool. So anyway, they come back to Own. Own is back in the house. This is now where you see the gelling of the team come together. Where Own is telling them things to do. This is the what we're going to do. This is now the plan. He's a Spartan. He knows he's going to do. He's hundred percent against all of their plans. He's like, I'm getting you guys out. You're not staying here. You're getting out of here. Yeah. I think uh, is it Evie or Saskia? Saskia heals him and helps him. Um, because his hip is badly damaged from his hunt with the with the uh, fight with the hunter, so Owen is wounded and not down, not a hundred percent, which I think is the only reason they did that is to make it seem reasonable why a Spartan would enlist help of kids in, in this situation. Yeah, that there's a little bit more to that as we talk as he convinces them to get up the next day and we're leaving. We're getting out of town. So he, because he says that there is UNSC somewhere, so we have to go towards them. I can't remember. This. There's a major city. Yeah. There's, there's somewhere to go. So they go ahead. He leaves them. Uh, he leads uh, the kids and meets the this big shield, a dome shield. It's a very uh, Stephen King under the dome moment where they suddenly find out they're trapped. Yeah. And that's why no one has come to help them. Exactly. That's why the comms aren't working. That's why no one come to help. There's no UNSC. There is only this one Spartan. I feel like this is why he like helps them more because I, I think Owen is very much... Because he says that uh, you know he, he separated from his team so he has to operate as if he were alone. And like it's not really ever clear what his like mission parameters are aside from just saving civilians. So when he sees the kids and they go out, that's his objective is to help these kids... Uh, seek shelter but then after they're under the dome he's like okay well now i need to use my resources yeah. and these kids to figure out a more yeah a more offensive strategy as opposed to a, just a search and rescue mission what i do like is that he does drip feed these kids he's not giving them information straight off the bat so he does give them little bits and pieces but doesn't spew out what the hell is going on so even in this mid book we don't actually know what what is happening other than just these kids trying to survive so they get ambushed when they're at the um at the edge of the dome and they kind of have to fight and they kind of scramble and get together so own kills off some pretty much some more uh grunts i think is it just grunts i want to say it's just grunts might have been a jackal too could have been a jackal or two so the guys they get some more weapons essentially they do a bit more scavenging he leads them back to the house to kind of regroup. And this is where the kind of story changes a little bit. Because now Owen realizes he's trapped. No support. There's more going on. So he kind of tells them the kind of that the Covenant are here looking for something. Because otherwise they would have been glassing the crap out of the place. So then he needs information to find out why. So he needs help. So he can't just do this all on his own. So then you have the moment of everybody coming together. Of Owen kind of loosely training them. I It's a... Uh... Rocky montage moment. Yeah. yeah, I was about to say that. This is the, here's the the montage book moment of a Spartan training four kids to like sneak through woods and shoot and stuff. So I guess there's, there's a little bit of cross training here going on. They're sneaking in woods. They climb up trees. This game is this game. This book is hammering home the fact that they're climbing up trees. Nobody locks up, 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 <laughs> up, up. Be up in the trees in your say. So that comes into play later on again. So 
that's pretty much it. He trains them for a day, maybe, and then decides, right, now we're going into town. And everybody's splitting up all the time. All this time, everyone's splitting up. Or yeah, well, everyone's going into town, but he 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 wants them to go on like reconnaissance missions and to like we need to learn more about why the covenant is here and why there's this dome. And so he he like trains them, but then also sends them out, and then that's how they find the locus and the the yeah. field clearing. Right? Yeah, that's right. So he splits them up into two teams. Uh, I forget who goes where. Uh, Dorian is essentially he stumbles across a hangar in a clearing and in this hangar is a conveniently placed prowler <laughs> very conveniently oh my goodness as in a stealth ship the ships that never ever go missing but here they are here's one that is clearly from i forget what they're called they sun- the sundered legion they call them they're like a group of insurrectionists yeah that were around about 100 years ago or 100 years before the story about 50 50 is it okay because some of the stuff they say 100 some of them say 50 so. 24 and 85 24 and 85. so there we have some sundered legion have a big hangar with power so i want to say it's probably evie because evie breaks in right and like hacks her way in it's a uh, saskia the door locks i think on the hangar belong to like a company that her parents company That's own. Right. so she knew the kind of backdoor code which was convenient but whatever it's okay, it's oh right. no it gets more convenient <laughs> yeah it gets even more convenient it's the number seven well it's not even the number seven it was zero zero it zero the- zero to reset the lock and seven for the override all right excellent so there you go, some bungee sevenness going in there, as as we know, they like the number seven. So there you go. The hangar door opens, the two kids go in, they find a spaceship that is working. That is a fully working prowler with weapons and stealth stuff and everything, just sitting there waiting to be used. The guys go, okay, excellent, our reconnaissance is hugely successful. We found uh, the most useful piece of equipment we could possibly find in this situation. <laughs> then we cut to the other team, which is going to say is now Vic- Victor and Evie, and they're looking around the town they're being all stealthy in the woods they're like super stealthy awesome amazing team i picture them like the predator just with like muck all over their face just blending in they see a locust mashing its way through the town center and then shooting its its beam weapon into the ground so clearly they they're smart kids they realize that this is a regular thing that happens saskia or evie knows is that like the outside of the the main town is like well worn by this vehicle so it's obviously doing this quite a lot so it's they're drilling in various places around the town drilling down into the ground so they're clearly looking for something and the kids put together this is why they're not glassing the whole place can i give minor spoilers because they don't mention it in this book sure but just the thing that they're looking for in case you're trying to put two and two together is terminal 14 and halo 2 anniversary it's uh, the luminaries okay, yeah. What's, what, what is this? The luminary that Regret finds, you know, in Halo 2 Anniversary. It's the location of Earth that the luminary finds and then gives it to Regret. And how do you know that it's here? Why do we know that that's specifically what they're looking for? It's on the... They're, they're digging under the ground for this Covenant or this Forerunner relic, but they don't get it until they drive humanity off the planet. They actually do find it on Meridian, yeah, do they? Yeah, it's on Meridian. Okay, that's a known thing. Okay, cool. We'll- Let's talk about this at the end of the book, because I think we're, we're getting into, like, after Let's this Let's keep book. moving, let's keep moving. All the team comes back, they all put their information together, and they come up with a loose plan of what they're going to go do. They go back to the house, don't they? They do go back to the house. They all convene together. They come up with a new plan. They're going to go and check out that spaceship. Ohm goes with Dorian back to the ship. Dorian climbs in. Switches the ship on. The ship instantly responds to Dorian's DNA and a, a, a name gets thrown out. It says, welcome back, so-and-so. He's like, I don't know who that is. So that's probably a major plot point in the fact that maybe his parents are not who they, we think they are. It's a Quinn Butane. Yeah, he, he vaguely mentions that he thinks his grandmother was a Butane. That's it, yeah. So then we have, obviously, his family is insurrectionist and his DNA is close enough that it's accepted by the ship. Owen is in the ship and touches something and the ship immediately goes to self-destruct mode. <laughs> so it starts warning and crazy letters. Own figures out I'm not supposed to be here. It doesn't like the energy signature of his suit. And so it's picking up something. So he's like, okay, I'm getting out of here. You fly the ship. Is it or Sas- probably Sasuke again because since they've paired these two up. They take this ship out for a spin. Turn on. Owen is convinced it has a stealth mode. So he's like, you'll find a stealth mode. There's a button called stealth mode. <laughs> Dorian pushes it, the ship goes into convenient stealth, and they fly all around the town, kind of reconnaissing, and Sasuke's looking down through the portal, and they're looking up and everything, and they see the beach, I think they see the locust and what it's drilling, 
they get a good look of like the entrances of various kind of like because Dorian knows where everything is. Is this where they town. find the location of the shield generator? Yeah, I think they notice the different areas of activity. They see that like, oh, these doors over here. Nobody's near these doors, so we should try and open them. Oh yeah, yeah, that's uh, for all this kind of stuff. Five. So they put together a plan of what they're going to try and also, do. Also, during the scene where he's flying the ship or first flying the ship. They really talk about how old this technology is, yet he's able to flawlessly fly this ship right away. Honestly, I would have liked him, like, accidentally, like, clipping a tree or something like that just to show that he was learning. They kind of, like, big up his pilot skills at the start that he's, you know, he's more than just a beginner because he's doing this, like, barrel roll and dropping out of the sky and restarting his engines. And But he'd only flown one ship before. And this is, like, really old old uh, insurrectionist technology and you would think the controls would be completely different. I think we're obviously, we're working under the system where you can drive a car, you can clearly drive an armoured tank sort of thing where we're just like, a, we're ignoring it conveniently. Yeah. It's convenient, it's working, it's, it gets the story moving. So anyway, it's a cool thing. Yeah. You can get Dorian flying around in a prowler, full of stealth mode, looking at everything. Awesome. Comes back, the guys reconvene again in the house with a new plan. Evie's decided she knows what, she, oh, this is where the other story comes into play. At some stage or another, uh, the AI tells them that there's a crap ton of flooding and that the the shelter is flooding right now. It's filling up with water because there's constant rain coming. That's the one thing. This, this, it's raining constantly and the town is slowly starting to flood, which means the shelter is actually slowly starting to flood. So the people are going to die in that shelter. So that's the major plot point to get these kids moving and kind of get the plot moving. The AI won't open the doors because the Covenant are still there. So it's like the Covenant threat is 100%. The threat of flooding is 80%. No, and so 98%. the Covenant wins. <laughs> it was only a 2% difference. It was so stupid. Oh, it is. Yeah, yeah, it's something really small. Oh, it's so dumb. I hate I hate her so much. Most of this book could have been avoided if she just was a smart AI. <laughs> yeah. And anyway, it cuts to, so Evie comes up with the idea that I can't make her think something. So I'll create a virus to make her think that the covenant threat is less than it is. And it's less than the threat of the flood. <laughs> oh, my God. The flood is in this book. Oh my god, the flood. Maybe that's what they're trying to They talk. were talking about how the flood were just all over the town. Like the roads had flood in them and then the, the yeah. they were had to walk through the flood to get where, everywhere. It was making them very wet and very uncomfortable. Owen said he notices that he goes out on patrol when everyone's asleep. So he's got everybody sleeping at during the day because they go out at night to do their reconnaissance missions and, and gather information. I mean, we're about halfway, almost two thirds of the way through this book now. And I like that it's not overly complicated in what the scale of what they're trying to do the major thing is what these kids want to do is get the people out of the shelter before it floods and that's just a simple easy thing they're not fighting the covenant even though they kind of are they're not like saving humanity even though the book trying to tell you that that's what they're doing it's just, just a small segment of something that's actually believable because of the skill set of the, these kids they do get to the fighting the covenant bit when they realize that once they once they save all the villagers they need to do deactivate the shield and so that's that's where the whole gun sort of thing came in. Also, we should probably mention this. Out of nowhere, Dorian's uncle has a shit ton of explosives. Yeah. And it's just like, oh, that's that's super handy. Let's just run over to his house real quick. Well, and what I don't understand about it is, like, they have Saskia. Saskia could have easily had a million explosives. At this point, she didn't tell them she had weapons, but they could have easily have just done that instead of having... Dorian yeah, have all these explosions. She also has like C four. Like that would have been because I think I, I think I might have missed that like thing. And when I read that, and I was like, oh, we got all the explosives from Dorian's house. Like, well, when did you do that? Like, <laughs> that happened. You off didn't screen. miss it. That's literally what happened. The way it <laughs> yeah, happened. they they it don't even show like... them going there. And obviously, they're setting Dorian up to be the child of the insurrection. An insurrection that doesn't know Absolutely, it. yeah. I got that impression as too that Uncle Max has a something dodge about him. Yeah, and they're obviously in cahoots with Saski is weapon dealing trader family especially because we'll get to where the end of the book goes where they come back but anyway i just wanted to ask the the saskia weapons thing is anyone else find it like cool that they've brought 
the Halo 5 yes, 100%. Warzone weapons in? Honestly, Halo 4 weapons. That's what I thought. I thought, oh, look, they found a cache of Halo 4 weapons. Interesting. I thought it was the mix. Because they had the sticky detonator, which was only in Halo 4. They had this railgun and sticky detonator, but they did have pretty much a mishmash of human weapons with Covenant tech. Yeah, one of them sounded Covenant, and the one that charged bullets with energy sounded like one of the Forerunner hybrids. I don't know why, yeah. but it did. That did sound like the Promethean rifle. But at this point, there would be no way for them to have access to that. Oh, it's Covenant. It's Covenant tech. Like, they, they say it's, they spell it out for you that it is Covenant. But I did kind of picture, you know. like, you know, how you can change the attachments and stuff in Halo 5's Warzone. I think it's just a, a much further step of integrating to where it actually creates a new gun as opposed to yeah. what they do in, like, Halo 5. And I'm pretty sure one of the weapons is the saw with the explosive ammunition, and I can't remember what it's called, oh, but really? it's one of the most amazing weapons. <laughs> yeah. The answer. The, the answer. answer. Yeah. I love that gun. Oh, my God. I love that they included the kind of uber weapons in this, and that, I guess that kind of maybe ups the kind of offensive capability of these kids that they going around with these uber weapons, and that's probably why they do so well. Honestly, do you think that this is going to be 343's way of incorporating those extra extra Halo 5 weapons into the lore with these like dealers that can just do random like just do random upgrades to these weapons yeah totally I like the, I like the idea that it's like the illegal weapons I mean think about where some of the other books have gone where you have other cities and stuff like that that are just like human and covenant living together and like the black market yeah, trade for true. weapons is huge do you know what I mean you, I love all those interactions so I like to see more of that come yeah, through yeah I'd really like to see more of the Halo five weapons just in the lore in general yeah it sounded like these weapons though were going to mainly the unsc because they did say when her mum when she had the little bit about her mum and the grenade launcher she did make a point of saying that the people that came to buy the grenade launcher wanted old school human tech they didn't want covenant weaponry yeah that could be twofold like maybe that's easier to smuggle with do you know what i mean get that through various checkpoints if you have old tech and not super uber tech that would super stand out as being obvious i got a flashback to the scene from the spider-man movie where they're selling he's trying to sell the guy this uber cannon at the back of a van and the guy's like i just want a handgun pizza time <laughs> you know what i mean <laughs> back to the story where are we yes so the guys are coming back they're reconvening they're putting together a plan they're they've got explosives and they've decided that they are going to try and hack into Salum and with a virus and change her code and they're gonna get all the survivors from one specific door bring them to the hangar and they're going to get everyone into the prowler and away it's going to be perfect plan at the same time they're going to take down the shield and right before all this they have like a little like firing squad thing where they're testing all the weapons so they kind of have a a huddle saskia has all these weapons in the bunker she's never actually been in there to be fair to her she just knows that there are weapon prototypes in this secret room but she never mentions it and i kind of liked how they described the fact that she never mentioned it because she didn't really trust them at the start and then when she did, she said she, she kind of didn't mention it because she hadn't mentioned it before. And then it got to the stage of, I think we've all been there and it's not just that you're going to, but we've, we, we've been there where we've not told somebody something and then we're like, it's too long since I told you, not told you that thing. It's harder to tell you it than to it's just such keep a not telling you it. It's thing too. It's so dumb. But I, I liked it and I, 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 I like I the conversation between her and Owen. Yeah, I like yeah, that Yeah, because like he, he basically was like, well, this is a team. You have to tell them. And then, like, he's like, guys, Sasuke has something to say. Yeah, just puts her on the spot. Completely put her on the spot. And, like, you know, she handles it like a teenager would. They get all the teenage drama out of that one moment. Yeah, that's true. Which I liked. Because they had her with the weapon. And then Evie outed Victor's love falling in love or, like, crush on Sasuke. And it's all in this big kind of open. Everyone laughs at how stupid everything is. And Owen pretty much says deal with your relationship crap guys we got shit to do yeah so even one of them said was like this is such high school drama yeah dorian (laughs) is laughing his ass off this whole thing happens and then owen basically forgives saski instantly when he walks in and goes "Ooh, real gun and he just goes yoink and walks off again i don't think he was ever really that pissed at her to be fair he had a very good beat on the situation and i think he's a very unspartan well obviously the spartan threes are unique in how they were created that they weren't so heavily doctrinated i don't think is the way spartan 2s were so he deals with the teenage and the kids very well i think and i liked his character arc where they talk about own wasn't a squad leader he was just a probably very unimportant spartan and now all of a sudden he is thrust in this team lead position yeah i got that sense too that that owns just generic spartan b company 
Yeah. But like he's in this he's in this this leadership position that does make him more of a Spartan. I I'd get that at that impression throughout the book. So I like that I like that too. And he he very much gets across the Spartan mentality of team. Team is first, you know, I mean team is everything. And he pretty much builds a team out of these people. He recognizes them, their potential for what they are, and he does a good job, I think. So then you have obviously the great scene of we're all been we've been waiting for it all book. We're like, what's in that weapon? What are these prototypes? Give me those weapons. Let me see what we got. And it's all the awesomeness that you could think of and some you couldn't. Like I think the sticky detonator is a very random weapon to find here and to use because I think it's almost never mentioned in Halo lore. Well, I think that's probably why they... I think they also did it to date the book where it's like, here are the Halo 4 weapons before Halo 4 and it's put in like almost like R&D uh, weapons testing. That's a great way. I didn't ever thought about that. Yeah. That's how I kind of looked at it. Like These are weapons that didn't exist in the first three Halo games because they were prototypes and here they are being prototypes. Until they got refined and whatever hiccups. Yeah. So you got the railgun, which own takes... Uh, you have the sticky detonator. You have various other assortment of guns that we don't hear a whole lot about, but essentially they are rifles and marksman rifles and whatnot that have Covenant tech grafted into them to do various things, um, like explosive ammo or energy beams and all sorts of awesomeness. So the team pretty much go through a series of weapons, blowing up trees in their back garden to their heart's content to figure out what all these weapons do. And um, there's some pistols in there like that are used, but I don't think they're really describe they might just be like uber magnums or whatnot or, or like the ce pistol yeah 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 well you imagine <laughs> if they just have a ce pistol they just shoot it once and win the book's over they just shoot at the shield and the shield automatically goes down yeah that's it <laughs> to shoot the shield shield goes down shoot the locust with the pistol it explodes shoot the covenant cruiser it, <laughs> it just explodes yeah they just they just shoot it upwards and just defeat the whole entire covenant armada. shoot regret in the head the covenant <laughs> just go they travel to high charity just shoot high charity once boom gone oh we skipped over a big section so i'll just cover it real quick here before they get all these weapons the guys have been scavenging weapons and they use the demo explosives to create distractions what they're trying to do is slow down the covenant they don't know what they're doing but they want to slow them down so they go to one of their dig sites plant a whole load of explosives and i think they have saskia shoot the locust yeah and shoot its weak point and to distract them so she's shooting a locust which i think is ridiculous technically we've never had to fight a locust in any of the halo games except halo wars so we have no idea how they actually work when you're playing a first person shooter true but it just sounds a little yeah. bit too much that you have saskia shooting at a locust hitting its weak point causing it to go on fire then she then runs away. They run back into the woods. Meanwhile, Owen is over with Dorian, I think, planting explosives on this dig site and pretty much blows up this dig site to stop them digging and random pylons and covenant stuff. So just so you know, the team have been kind of shooting and working out and they are somewhat proficient at things. So now we cut back to, okay, the final plan is now we're going to go take out the shield while you guys go rescue the guys from the shelter. the shelter so this is the kind of the third kind of phase of the book the third act kind of big fight this is what we're all coming to everybody's got their weapons they're trained they're eager they're all going to sh display their amazing skills in the final fight evie plants her virus in the ai the dum dum ai dum -dum. it totally works dum dum opens up this one specific <laughs> door where sasuke is waiting she goes in has a kind of a cool moment of like it's already flooded so she starts to panic and she's waiting through this flooded tunnel finds a bunch of people and pretty much has a trouble kind of no one everyone's kind of ignoring her they're all kind of walking around they don't really realize it because she's just some kid they don't realize where she came from she gets a uh, gets a hold of this intercom system talks through it does a really good job i think they mentioned that like own had kind of told her like they're not going to be come very helpful they're going to be dazed they're going to be confused you're going to have to take charge so she kind of shoots off her gun to get everyone's attention. Everyone kind of focuses on her then. She gives her a little speech or a little bit, gets everybody riled up. Like, this is what we're going to do. Everybody come and follow me. Let's go do this thing. Something I was expecting in this scene is she's kind of talking to Salome about broadcasting this message. And she says the Covenant are still here. And Salome just doesn't care. Yeah. I was expecting her to be like, oh, shit, I have a virus. And then, like, I shut it all down. I saw that coming, too. But what the, the what I think the sort of thing they're going off of is that like Evie tapped into like I guess Salome's like main sort of uh, thing, and then what Saskia was talking to in the bunker was just like a a smaller sort of program that was kind of supporting the bunker. I just got the impression that they dialed 
back her sensitivity because it sounded like any covenant on the planet she was going to keep the bunker lock and they've just dialed it back to like okay. you know 80 80 percent covenant or they've oh yeah so they've lowered the percentage to where it's less than 98 percent is okay. probably what the virus did but like saskia was panicking because solo made it sound like the covenant was gone and everyone in the thing was talking oh this is great we can return to home where they can't and that's that was the panic was she didn't think that they would take her seriously and it all yep, I totally to do not buy that a bunker full of adults listened to a teenager and did what she told them. I wouldn't. Do you think the whole town knows that she's the daughter of the rich per- the rich family? Oh, well, true. She does say her name and everyone goes, oh. Yeah, there is a reaction to her name. Also, if it's an insurrectionist town and they're the insurrectionist arms dealers, it sounds like the family name carried some weight. Yeah. There was recognition there, and that plus the fact that she was shooting into the sky made everyone pay attention to her. She got her point across, kept the story moving, so they're, they're <laughs> going to start moving towards the actual the bunker, the, um, the spaceship. Now we cut to the more exciting part of the plan. We have Dorian, Victor, and Owen, the boys. That's right, the boys. The boys are going to go shoot up some aliens. So the guys go down to the beach, they plant their last explosives, their convenient explosives, and blow up the um, shield generator. The shield generator. The like pylons. And then there is Covenant everywhere. There is banshees, there is grunts, there's elites, there's jackals, all sorts coming out of the woodwork here. So the guys are working overtime to kind of shoot and kill, and they're doing all sorts of heroics. They got a truck. They got a truck. Well, no, well, Evie arrives at the truck to pick them up as their evac. Oh, that's there. She comes in, she comes in Victor's car, which is a kind of funny scene later on but essentially the guys are on the beach they're shooting up they're doing their absolute best dorian or victor one of the guys has the answer which is a saw and pretty much shoots down a banshee which is kind of cool um but he makes a point of like his weapon is shooting explosive rounds that is wrecking covenant troops the elites aren't here yet so i think they're doing so well because they're fighting jackals and grunts i think that's the big kind of impression i'm getting um because the elites show up now in the story so you have both saskia leading a group of guys so evie runs back and evie meets up with the survivors saskia meanwhile the covenant have caught up the survivors moving through the woods and they're screaming and panicking because elites are coming and they're shooting in a lot of things happen very fast um saskia shoots at an elite who's holding up a human elite pulls out his sword and chases her into the woods so she kind of her plan is to lead him into the woods and kind of hide away so she climbs up a tree and there's a kind of fight scene described of her just shooting. She has a plasma rifle. So she's shooting an elite as it's climbing And a tree. he's like just jumping up to try to get her. It's like, she what? basically becomes Arnold Schwarzenegger in The Predator. Yeah, it's it's a weird situation of like they're shooting each other and she's jumping down off the tree to kind of get around them and she's hiding in the brush. He eventually climbs the tree, but because he's so heavy, breaks the branch. He crashes down, yeah. And she sort of shoots his arm off. I got, that's the impression. I didn't think it came off, but she... She disables and like it. Injures, and like injures him, injures his arm badly, like basically breaks it. She pretty much empties the plasma rifle into him point blank. It overheats. And he breaks, eventually brings brings his shield down, and then he he's wounded. This elite is wounded to the point where you can see that he's raging at the fact that it's defeated by a human kid and runs off into the woods, obviously to get reinforcements. So meanwhile, she comes back. Evie meets up with the survivors. Some of the survivors have guns themselves, and they manage to kill an elite. And then, pretty much, there's a brief reunion of Sasuke and Evie. Okay. Then we got to get to it. It's crazy that she survived an elite, but whatever, she did. Also an elite with an energy sword, which means he's higher up. He's like an officer or something. He's not a minor elite. Yeah, I guess, you know, his arrogance got the better of him. The situation was unique. I don't know really how to play this down. The elite had a lot, didn't have a lot of sleep. He got bumped on the head. He's he's not... <laughs> he's tired. He's, he's had a long day. Then meanwhile, Evie realizes that there's crazy stuff going down the beach. She's got to go. Her plan was to get uh, Victor's car and meet up with the team and bring them back to the off the beach to the shelter. That's a shelter. The dropship. Dropship. Cut to Evie driving. The guys in the beach. They're getting their ass kicked. It's something's crazy going down. They're all hiding behind Owen because Owen can take the plasma charges. Then one of the grunts drops a grenade and it blows up and that's Owen knocked out of the situation. Did they stick him? I yeah, thought they, they stuck, stuck him. him on his side. Yeah, it like blew off part of his like leg armor because he had trouble. He had trouble walking. It either went off right next to him, or maybe it actually did stick him. But I got the impression it didn't stick him, but got very close to him because one of them. I got the impression one of them dropped it as it was being shot or running away in panic, 
and he's down. Meanwhile, the elites have shown up on the beach. They're just slowly walking towards the kids. They empty their weapons at them pretty much ineffectually. The elites kind of break up. It all looks really bad because Owen is like, leave me. The guys are like, hell no, we're not leaving you behind. And Owen is like, leave me. <laughs> the guys are like, hell no, we ain't leaving you behind. Meanwhile, the elites are still coming. And then what you can only imagine as a hilarious scene as Evie comes down in her car, drives through all of these <laughs> elites, knocking them flying, killing how many of them, screeches up to the guys. The dramatic moment in any kind of movie when this kind of happens, they get in the car. Also rolls rolls down her window, shoots the sticky grenade, and then the elites don't do anything because they don't know what it is. They just walk right over it and then it blows up. It's so weird. <laughs> <laughs> what a dramatic in- intro she just made this, this like epic beach war scene also the warthog music from red versus blue is playing during that whole time the guys managed to get Owen in the back of the car they can't lift him up he's too heavy but he moves in anyway it's really emphasized that Owen is fucked up he's in bits they get him in the back of the car. They open the door and like a plasma ball hits the door and it flies off or some shit. And you get the Victor going, oh no, my car. <laughs> and it's kind of like a ridiculous moment. <laughs> so I was like, oh, all right, okay. You know, Owen's dying in the back. He's like, ah, oh, shit, you ruined my car. How does a regular run of the mill consumer car hold a Spartan in the back seat? I also thought that. Uh, don't think about, don't let me think about that. Yeah, no, it's, fu- it's future car, man. It's future <laughs> it's car. It's future fine. Car. <laughs> Also, it doesn't get stuck on the beach at all. So, do you know what I mean? It's fine. It's future car. So, anyway, the guys, the, pretty much Evie gets them out. So, the car is going back to... Dorian is directing them through the woods because he knows all the woods. So, he's trying to get them as close as Clara to the ship. Meanwhile, cut to Saskia and the survivors. The Covenant have found them again. There's a crazy fight going on between the few humans that do have weapons and the guys who don't. There's a scene kind of where Saskia and Evie are talking to, like... You recognize him as the waitress from a cafe, and she seems to be like really, a woman like in charge moment. with these weapons. Yeah, there's a cool moment of this woman and the various sort of survivors picking up weapons and just being battle ready. I imagine this is a, these are the people that managed to kill an elite. Well, what was cool is that like earlier on when when Saskia like first started to escort them out, they're like, "Hey, if there's anyone who wants to like help and like shoot or whatever, want to fight, let me know, and I'll let you know." Otherwise, and so she came up like, I want to fight. I want to help. And she's like, all right, here's my pistol. Go fight. And so then she's kind of peppered in a scene every couple of pages. And then when Evie comes in, she goes, oh, I recognize that. She's the waitress at the diner. It's just like. Oh, yeah, I did think that was it, cool. Like the way that those like the sequencing and kind of how that how that character kind of had its own little story and how just these type of events just really change just who you are. And it doesn't matter what yeah. your job was before so yeah i really i really like that i also took in the same way that aaron was thinking that maybe this is a more insurrectionist town than we think and we got people embedded everywhere in this town who just know what to do and maybe they're just embedded there in that kind of way anyway the the team is coming back the covenant are firing on the survivors there's got to be people dying left right and center but it's never really kind of mentioned there was a moment where like two people the got jackal sniper yeah and they had to carry those people they make it sound like these people were uh, still alive yeah it sounded like the jackal shot to slow them down well, i thought one person was like bleeding from the gut i guess they could have been alive they did they did make that point yeah that maybe we could save them when we get to the ship the pg version yeah yeah the pg version so then we get the guys own is in the back of the car evie is running the team is trying to get back to the um hanger the hanger that's the word i keep fecking up <laughs> own is having a hard time because now he realizes we have to get to the hangar we have to get out of here. there's too much covenant so we have to run through no man's land which is where the humans and covenant are shooting each other so own is pretty much protecting dory now get behind me uh, Victor and Evie run away to a different area. I'm not sure how they the logistics of this, but it ends up being just Owen and Dorian. Owen puts on his Uber. I'm a goddamn Spartan about to die. Do you know when you get your last legs? And he sprints with Owen, with Dorian through No Man's Land. Takes a bunch of shots to kind of get through. Makes it to the end. He is. He runs straight into the spaceship and knocks off it, but is still alive. Everybody kind of piles into the ship. Dorian climbs in, activates the weapon systems, and starts shooting rockets left, right, and center and blowing up Covenant right before he takes. So that's pretty much kind of everyone kind of cheers a little bit when they realize Dorian. Ha- I thought it was funny. He came over to con system and said, no, no, that explosion was yeah, a good thing. That was us. Everyone's like, oh, yeah, because they kind of panic for a minute and see the big explosion. But he's like, oh, yay. So the Covenant <laughs> kind of retreat a little bit. And then you pretty much get the scene of everybody climbing onto the ship. Owen is bleeding out, but still alive. He's very pale. 
Um, the guys are like at the various stations at the computer. So Evie and Victor are both at the comm stations and the weapon stations. And Dorian is like, right, we're taking off. So pretty much you have the Prowler taking off and going up into space. And he kind of a brief moment of like panic when you think, has no one thought to check? Is this ship space worthy? Could it even do this? We don't know. It's too late now. We're burning up. Everybody's screaming in the back, but he's doing it. So then he pushes through into space and then he immediately becomes under fire by a a Covenant Corvette, which I thought was a little bit crazy. But anyway... Also, they mentioned that the Corvette can't see them because they're cloaked, even though the other books definitely point out that stealth only works when you're, like, going slow and not doing crazy things like breaking orbit from a planet. Yeah, also, like, stealth doesn't make you invisible. It makes you radar invisible. Well, I think that's kind of what they were saying to where it's like they, they can't quite see us, but they know we're there. I get the feeling this is like the bad the bad act of camo that the Spartan 3s have. It sounds like the ship goes kind of shimmery. Yeah. Yeah. But in a way, it's working to their advantage. <laughs> Own gives the guys a military code to say, to talk, cock, patch into UNSC, go on this channel, say this code number, you'll get help. Meanwhile, which is kind of a the guys, they keep shooting missiles at this Corvette and kind of chase it away, which I think is ridiculous. Given the size of the ship, they must be into what they're facing. But their missiles and rockets are somehow doing damage and eventually scare off this ship. The guys then fly up a little bit higher. They use the military channel to give the secret code. The Spartans are... The commander of the UNSC kind of realizes, okay, yep, you're a Spartan. Come on in, everybody. It's A-OK. So then we kind of get the story of um, everybody coming together the survivors all get brought onto the UNSC ship they get split up in terms of like you need help come here you need meetups or whatever you get food and shelter down this way so you get the lovely scene of everybody meeting up with their family all this kind of stuff and I did really like the moment of Saskia becoming kind of like kind of impromptu leader of the group and not having anywhere to go kind of panicking and kind of like feeling super bummed and then they have Evie coming over with her dad and it's a lovely moment of them kind of just kind of bonding it's like yeah you stay with us you come with us your parents aren't here so you stay with us until we figured it figured this out and that was a cool a really kind of nice moment I like that a lot and that's more or less it they rush on into operation or upper operating he gets rushed away and that's kind of it more or less then you get kind of the big moment of oh my god this is crazy of only wants to talk to these kids. So I guess they're giving it a day or two. It was like two days. Two days, right. So all the kids are brought back in to meet with this only sergeant lieutenant person with only. They get the Medal of Honor. They all get the Medal of Honor, which is kind of crazy, which is the highest civilian award. Which I find that's interesting that the like in in Halo, the highest civilian honor is the Medal of Honor. <laughs> <laughs> Whereas like right now it's the, you know, the highest like military or at least American military. So I thought that was kind of neat that it's now a civ- like a, a civilian uh, civilian metal. thing. Yeah, there must be another thing for a military to get. I can't remember. You imagine Spartans get them all the time anyway. Then pretty much this lieutenant kind of debriefs them a little bit and fills them in and like, yeah, the Covenant are looking for something. We want to know what it is. What we what we would like to do is train you guys up, <laughs> recruit you, and send you back to Meridian <laughs> to figure out what's uh... going on. So I was like, oh my god. Oh, that just seems so unlikely. Like, yeah, but then you realize it is a series of books, so this is what they're doing. Well, there is like a small little line where they were like, you know, we have some support we can give you, but it would be helpful to have locals who know like the area. But they have topographical maps. <laughs> yeah, it's it's a it's I'm not it's still a stretch, but I I was just like so you're sending in like people who've spent i don't know five plus years training to be whatever service person they are and then they have to now like take orders from these 18 year olds They're like oh you know you're almost oh. of age so you know it's just like the same thing it, we're kind of yeah. trying to go for a vibe similar to ferret team i thought the ferret team yeah that's the vibe i got yeah. as well that they'd be given a handler somebody to supervise them maybe own and then they're pretty much given kind of whatever very specific missions now, I think it, they make it sound like we're going to train you, but it's going to be super slim down training. We need this, we need that. I could see this team being useful in only one way, one way only. That very specific village area, and they need local knowledge of that. Oh, by the way, you were you were asking, because someone will tell us otherwise, highest award a UNSC soldier can get is the Colonial Cross. That's what uh, Captain Keys gets after his death in Halo 2. Oh, that's what oh, Miranda yes, that's, did. Oh, yes, that's the award ceremony, what Miranda picks up. Okay, cool. Good to know. 
So that's kind of the book and the story. All the team agree to become this super team. I did not like that. I, I feel like their decision was too quick. Yeah, two days. Or like I, I can I can get Saskia's like you know what my parents Need yada yada. But then like you won't be alone. Yeah, you won't be alone. And they all look at Dorian. Yeah, I guess I'll do it. <laughs> Yeah, pretty much. I mean, the merit to this, which I thought was very good, was Owen's comment on it all. He says, give it a day or two to think about it. You'll find civilian life very difficult from now on. You'll see. I found that very interesting. Yeah, I liked, I I just, I wish like that scene was like the first scene in the next book. Yeah. So where it's almost like, almost like we as as a reader have been given 10 months to digest this book and then... Now we come back to it. Okay, it's a new story, yada yada yada. So like, it's been a week since this, since the first story, and I don't know. I feel like that would have been stronger instead of it already giving you like, oh yeah, they're ready to suit up for the next mission. I think it just seems way too soon after these major events in their lives to sh- to turn these people around and send them back down. And I see people because at the end of the book, it made a big comment of they're not kids, and I like the comment that Dorian trolls at this only lieutenant that. You're super happy to send kids in to do your fighting. And she turns back and go, you're not a kid. In terms of they're very close to obviously enlistment age. I kind of get that Oni would do something like this. So like I'm not all surprised about the meeting. I just think that given these kids and what they went through and all this and that they're so happy to see their families that I think it was just a little too quick for them to be ready to to join the UN, like the, to join Yeah, Oni. none of these kids seem like they're warriors or battle, you know. I get that it, we have to get there. I just think they got there too quickly. I would have liked yeah. more bickering and fighting between them. Make, yeah, I think so too. You know, maybe Dorian ended and was like, you know what, no, I'm going to go hang out with Uncle So-and-so. And then that kind of plays in with X, Y, and Z. And Anyway, maybe we get that later. But that was, that was one of my gripes. That was just like, really, I read this whole book and it's just... They're just minions now. Yeah. We've actually gotten a lot out of this book. Way more than I thought. So, um, guys, what do what, what you think about it? What's your thoughts? It's not written for us. Overall? Overall, it's okay. Yeah. I can see where it would make a big impact on a different person, a different audience. I think it's good from that perspective. From our perspective, no, not really. Aaron, what you got? Okay, my best description for this book is, does anyone remember the 2010 movie Red Dawn? No, but I know what you're talking about. Yes. This is something similar. Where it is, like, is it like Russia invades? It's Chris Hemsworth, and I think it's like North Korea, and Chris Hemsworth is like the soldier home on leave who takes the teens and turns them into a commando squad. It's not very good. And like, it's, <laughs> I don't mean it's not very good, and like, the, the book's all right, but they make an awful lot of leaps that I don't totally buy. And it's a little too convenient that some of the things are the way they are. Like, it's not a bad book. It's not the usual... I kind of get what they're going for with, like, the sort of slightly more teen save the day. Yeah, I mean, that's what that's what we got to think. That we're... How we judge these books is not like any other books we've done before. This is a young adult. It's like a different level, different audience. If you want to point out the difference, Legacy of Onyx, the difference between this book and Legacy of Onyx, where both books are about teens saving the day... I think Legacy of yeah. Onyx hits it in more right notes than this one does for me. Okay, yeah. Okay. What I did like, I know exactly what you mean, but what I did like up to the very end is the scale of what this team was trying to I believed that these kids could do mostly of what the stuff they were doing. Um, I thought fighting the locusts was a bit ridiculous. The beach scene was a bit much. They should not have survived so so easily. With like, I guess you know the Spartan would be the focus. I guess they would take the most shots, the most damage and stuff. But at the same time, the stuff that these guys achieve is a lot. Uh, with little Grant, uh, Orin, what, what did you want to say? My my biggest sort of suspension of disbelief comes from basically the climax. Unfortunately, because what this book is trying to do is is focus on these teenagers and yes, make it quote unquote young adult. But it's also putting in the conventions of a typical Halo story where you have these fight scenes, you have the the enemy alien faction that you have to overcome through military tactics. And so they pepper they pepper that in to make it Halo, but they're trying to tell a story that is a, a little lesser in scale compared to other stories. And for the most part, like really like two thirds of the book, it I think it does work. Like when they're, when they yeah. when they find the grunt and they're fighting that jackal and they're doing all these things, but when a, an elite is chasing you with two swords and you're climbing a tree and 
you know, like that's just kind of where it starts getting a little muddied. And it, and I feel like they have set pieces like that to make it more Halo. And so that's where I think the book kind of falls a little bit or like the guy who uncovers a, a military insurrections, a hybrid uh, spaceship and then is able to fly. Like, I don't even know how many people there are. Like, are people crammed in the ship, like, yeah. from the shelter? Like, you know, like, like I was I was imagining, like, multiple trips happen, but they did it all in one trip, so... That's what I mean. The population of this town must have been small. It must have been, yeah. So, like, it did a very nice job, I thought, of, like, introducing the characters, getting their dynamic. It had the teen drama, and even though I'm not really into, like, teen drama, but, like, I felt like it was authentic. But it just kind of didn't hold the water it was trying to hold towards the end when it when it tried to balloon just enough to give you that halo combat that you get in the other book so that's kind of how i digest it all i like this book i do there are there is a suspension of disbelief needed in some of the scenes the training montage all that kind of stuff i we may come across a little bit harshness but i think we have to realize it is a different style of book for halo at the same time that doesn't give it a free pass in certain things but I do like it. I thought the story moved really well. I appreciated how fast we got things moving. And like I said, the scale and what the, the guys were trying to achieve. I, at the same time, I agree completely with Oren with the ending of it being too soon in terms of like the rapid turnaround of like this team agreeing to do this. I can see what they're trying to do. And it's obvious, like I said, from the start, it is a series. They're creating new books. They're creating a series of books out of these, these this team of people. And it just like countered like almost on myself, like, you know, a lot of the Halo books actually does deal with teens. Like the whole Spartan program is all about minus Spartan fours are all about teenagers doing true. this stuff. What the difference is is that like these teenagers are quote unquote normal teenagers. Yeah. And so there's there we're not expecting them to do the crazy things that these Spartans have been doing because they go through years of training and do all these, you know, that they're um enhanced with different fluids and stuff. And so they're they're Halo has this universe already pre-existing. And so to just throw these teenagers into it, I think they they do well to kind of build it up in the first two thirds. But then the last yeah. third, I think they made just a little bit too much of a jump where they could have made it a little bit more grounded, a little bit more simple, and then give us the training at the end of or the beginning of the next book and give us back into Meridian and then do a little bit more and then maybe these guys you know we can get into the post story stuff can you definitely have more to work with after it but i think it, it got a little too excited at the end of this book completely agree honestly i feel like this is a book that i wish had come out when i was a teenager <laughs> yeah i probably would have enjoyed it a lot more as an interesting talking point how do you guys think this book is as an introduction to the halo universe if this was trying to get new halo fans how well do you think this book i like do? how it's kind of a soft entry to the universe it gives you as it if you were a teenager it gives you a bunch of characters from a bunch of different backgrounds you're going to identify with at least one of them it gives you a good background on what spartans are what the different covenant is it gives you its background on forerunners just a very, very short and simple backgrounds on all the different factions and all the different things that are going on in a very compact and easy to digest way. That's what I think we need to take away from this book, what it was trying to do and how well it achieved it. And I think it did do a good job of that. Like you very succinctly said, Krista, it gives you a great little intro to all the factions. Even the insurrectionists, you get a background. Like Yeah, and even touches on it, which you wouldn't expect. I wouldn't have expected in a book like this. I thought it would simply go human alien but it brings in the extra element of human v human. Having been a teenager that got into Halo through Fall of Reach, I don't necessarily know. I don't think this would have roped me in the way that Fall of Reach and Halo First Reach Strike did. did. Yeah. But you gotta remember, like, you were watching Star Trek as a kid, right? Yes. So you're used to the high sci-fi kind of stuff going on. A lot of a lot of media today aren't as high sci-fi as they used to be. There's not a there's not crazy sci-fi shows right now. I could see a teenager who's not used to like all the crazy mumbo jumbo that it, that's in Fall of Reach, which is good mumbo jumbo. I love the mumbo jumbo, but this is a book for young adults, teenagers. It could even go younger than that. Just giving you something to identify with it's hard to identify with a kid who's only lived in the military i think this is a yeah. much more um human novel and i think teenagers are yeah. very much more emotionally driven than intellectually driven at this point in their life so an emotionally driven book is probably better best for them than something very technical like fall of reach 
I read Fall of Reach as a kid, but I wasn't a normal teenager. <laughs> Fair enough. I could see this book being the thing that you find in the school library and be like, ooh, shiny, what's this? Yeah. And maybe getting into Halo that way, but yes, not for Do you me. think this book might have been mar- marketed a little bit more towards female teenagers as opposed to male teens with like a pink cover and the fact yeah. that it's yeah, like a young adult novel? I guess so. I mean, I'm not sure. Yeah, I don't know. Do you skew gender wise when you write these kind of books? I guess you could say, yeah, sparkly pink cover. It's well, I mean, it was thing. written I, by I, a I, woman as well. So, I mean. There's an element to that. I mean, we, we're seeing more and more female Authors come into the Halo universe. I mean, we did Kelly Gay's coming in. Karen yeah, Kelly's. I don't know. I'm just trying to think on it because, like, basically, my my young adult teenage novels were basically Harry Potter and Twilight. So, well, Twilight was a very girly novel as well. And, but and then, but like, and Harry Potter became such like a huge cultural phenomenon. But like, that's 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 what I'm trying to just think of. And I get this is starting to get kind of way off topic, and we could even do our own show on like just this exploration. But it's just. Yeah, it's just interesting that I think I think it's what we got to take away, like David's been saying, is like, this is just a different approach to introduce people into the the universe as opposed to a fall of reach boot camp with teenagers uh, similar to like Ender's game. Yeah, well, Aaron, you have your niece and nephews, which I know they're working through fall of reach, but do you think this would be an easier novel for them to read to get into the universe? I would say it has to be. I mean, I understand you would agree that maybe Halo Reach is a better novel, but like if you're introducing someone at the well, and also age. like if your reading level's low, this is a really easy book to read for a lower reading level. I suppose that might be true, although I kind of wonder, does it set you up then to think Halo is something different than what you're going to get? Because like if you read this and you go, oh, Halo, and then you go to Fall of Reach or God forbid you go to the Forerunner trilogy first. <laughs> Halo has changed a lot since we started, dude. So, like, it is probably this book more accurate to what Halo is now as opposed to what it was when we were reading Fall of Reach. A lot of um, themes kind of made me think of, you know, Veda and Fred and their relationship, kind of. Just the interaction with Saskia and Owen kind of made me think of the human Spartan interactions that happened in Last Light and Retribution. Yeah, I'm glad we're getting more of those because I think... um... It's important, and we don't see them in the game, so it's good to see them in the universe. Like, reading this, I think I got the most connections and call-outs to, like, the more Halo, the more recent modern Halo games, like Halo 4 and Halo 5, with the different weapons and the guns, and Meridian being a common planet between the two. So I think there's also a connection there where you play this, and then, oh, well, the newest Halo game is Halo 5. You play that, oh, you go to Meridian. Well, cool, I just read that in the book. I, I think yeah, they're a good point. being conscious of, of those elements as well. They had to try to get a different generation in at some point. And then, like, the other yeah. thing is, you read this, and then they've also tied these books into Outpost. Yeah. You read these books, and then you decide you want to go to the Halo convention. Yeah, that's true. Or the other way around, you go to the Halo convention and you find the books. And that's kind of cool. Yeah. Any kind of closing points, guys? Do we want to talk about... I, I took some notes while we were talking, some kind of post-story points. I know we're getting to about an hour and a half now. But do we want to talk the, the terminal from Halo 2 Anniversary or kind of develop maybe some interaction as ties that were in the book that we might see in the next book. I think just loads. I think just loads come in. The yeah, next I, book. Think I think they left be loads of little breadcrumbs. Loads of the, like the names of the different characters. The kind of the insurrection ties are there. There's huge amounts of forerunner esque stuff going back in. And like Aaron said, I didn't have a clue about the whole Marine fight. So yeah, talk talk some more about that before we finish up. So kind of we know what what we're going what we're getting to next i believe the info that comes from halo 5 talks about there's a specific captain it mentions who kind of like fought the end of the battle of meridian over the three years the basic gist of it is meridian is like a supply hub for the unsc and for some reason the covenant didn't lay their full force into it they wanted to isolate meridian and cut off supplies moving out through the through the unsc and then they wanted to get onto the planet because there is a Forerunner relic, which apparently, if we're going by how this book's going, is buried under the town of broom sur mer Because in Halo 2, you have the terminal, I think it's Terminal 14, where a group of elites are on a glassed meridian after the battle has ended and they've driven away the UNSC. And they release one of those little drones that came in the... 
Remember the little drone they had in the comic series that we couldn't tell what it was? The blue team comics? It was like a... Oh, and collateral damage? Collateral damage. It's a little mapping drone. So they took that, released it in the tunnel, and they find this forerunner structure. They go in, they find a luminary. They take it back to the Prophet of Regret, and it must take them about a year, like Krista said, for them to translate the luminary. I think there's a line of dialogue. It's something like the luminary was not forthcoming with its information. But basically, they find the planet Erda Tyring, which is Earth, which Regret doesn't know. And then Regret rustles up all of the ships that he has in his little fleet, and he sets sail to Earth, and then that's the start of Halo 2. So this is how Meridian sort of ties into it. Cool. I never copped that, or I don't see, I don't remember any of these details. We should, we should revisit the terminals, because I feel like there's... Like, every other book we read, like, has a tie to, like, one of them. I think the data in Halo 5 we'll have to maybe dig out and have a look at, because I don't remember finding that data anywhere, but I do remember there being, I think there were text drops of information in that hub level in Halo 2, because I remember you had to, like, there were mean, yeah. there were data pads, because I think you had to, like, climb on top of one of the buildings to get some of them. I remember doing it, but I don't remember any of the information I read. Same. <laughs> no, I was the same. It was the Halopedia article that led me to it, because I was going through the Thanks. Ah, Halopedia, you're so good. I was hoping to find an exact date, you see, for when this book started, and then I was reading through the Battle of Meridian stuff, and that's what led me to this. That's about it. Very good to know. Uh, Oren, anything else in your notes you want to touch upon before we wrap up? Um, no, I think I said what I gotta say. Okay, overall, good book. Little bit craziness in the middle of it. Yeah, just, it's a, it's an overall just, yeah, good book. Or just okay book. Yeah, you have to take it on the, the understanding of the way it was written and who it was written for. But overall, like Chris just said at the start, I think there's no huge amount of lore implications to this book. It is all character driven. It is all about the team. It is not about what they're doing at the moment. And like you said, like we just touched upon, if that's the end of the story of like what they dig out and what they find, we can kind of assume that the next books and stories aren't going to change anything in the canon hugely. They're just going to be about these characters. To be fair, I'm intrigued with. Yeah, it's just, it's just another story to tell. The one thing I want out of these books before we go is if we do not get something on the Sundered Legion, which sounds like the coolest name so far for any group we've had in Halo, I'll be very upset. Yeah, me too. <laughs> I think there is definitely more coming there. You get the impression that they did the same thing that happened in uh, Silent Storm where they obviously broke away from the Navy with these Prowlers and there's some cool story to that somewhere. There must be and the fact that you have this abandoned hangar with this fully functioning ship must tell you that like that Sunder Legion is not around anymore. That or they're just in hiding and they expect it to come back. You don't leave your equipment running and like maintained unless you plan to come back for it. Oh dude I did not get the impression this thing was maintained at all but that's the, in fact of just how worn down that area was full of grime and dirt it wasn't maintained. The fact that it worked at all is what I had a problem with it sounds kind of ridiculous but anyway, anyway, anyway <laughs> we've gone in about this. This is a good book. doesn't go anywhere crazy with the lore, but I think it is worth a read. It is interesting. I think it may actually be a very good introduction to the Halo lore as a whole because it introduces all the facts and it's very nicely and neatly for you. A little bit of suspension of disbelief in certain areas, but um, other than that, fair play. Side note on the ASMR. Oh, God. Audio book. Audio book. Jesus. Yeah. I, I, can I have a minute to complain? Just for a second. You can. You I'll go. give you 20 seconds because I we need to get going. Okay. <laughs> that is the only audiobook I have never finished and I will never go back to it. I am very sorry to the girl that narrated it, but I, I, I just can't. I can't cope with it. I can't do it. And it's not that it's a female narrator because we also have a female narrator for Halo Renegades. Much better. The two of them do suffer slightly from woman doing man's voice where everyone's, every man kind of sounds the same, and in my head they all sound about 18, no matter what age they are. But the the whispery ASMR just killed me. If that's what teenagers are into, then I don't understand them anymore. <laughs> I don't know what teenagers are listening to audiobooks, to be honest, but anyway. Yeah, I I agree. No, I, I tried. I, I gave it a whole chapter and was like, I just, I'll just read this one, I guess. <laughs> Yay, real books. Okay, we talked way too much on this book that I didn't think we would, but uh, I'm happy. It's good. It's a good sign, I think, that we we all came away. It deserves discussion. It does, and discourse your time to read. I think it is worthwhile. There you go, guys. That's Battleborn. Hooray! Thank you all for listening. Yay! We are Halo Podcasts Evolved, and come check us out our amazing website, HaloPodcastsEvolved.com. It has a brand new store. As a speaking, we got stuff. We got merch. 
Ian is crazy. And come check us out on Facebook. We have an amazing Discord group as well. Um, just look for Halo Podcast Evolved and you'll find us. And that's all, guys. Evolve. Evolve. Evolve.